Christoph, we've all grown up with the mind-body problem. It's the way the relationship between our brains and our consciousness has been framed for uh, many centuries, and uh, we all hear philosophers talking about this. Uh, as a neuroscientist, someone who has really focused on consciousness in the laboratory, how do you begin to approach the mind-body problem? Well, I, first of all, I like to think about it neuronally, not just uh, the mind-body, but the mind-brain problem, because the brain, it's not my liver that's responsible <laughs> for generating consciousness. I need my liver, but the liver doesn't generate consciousness. It's not the heart, unlike Aristotle thought. Again, it's my brain. So it's really a mind-brain problem. And then it's not just the brain. The relevant elements, we think, is not quantum mechanics, is not single molecules, it's probably neurons, nerve cells. So I think the right way to think about the mind-body problem is to think about the mind and vast number of neurons, so-called coalition of neurons that give rise to any one specific con con um, uh, conscious percept. So it's going to be some, so think of it like, like election in a, let's say, democracy like in India or here like in the US. You have um, vast coalitions, sometimes of very strange bad fellows, but they come together on some, with some degree of regularity to elect somebody. Right, and uh, so you have a winning coalition, and you've won a more losing coalition, and that's what happens with consciousness. You have there's all this turmoil going on in my brain because all these different things compete for my attention. You know, I'm looking at you. There's a blinking light over there. There's some voice over there. So uh, you know, I can only attend to one of a few things, which means the neurons that represent those different things in my brain they're competing and. Some lose out, and there's going to be, at any given point in time, one winner. Namely, that's a coalition of neurons that ultimately I'm conscious of. So right now I'm conscious of your face. And then, you know, a fraction of a second later, because something else happens, something else intertrudes, attracts my attention, I shift my, my consciousness and the way it's expressed at the, neuro, at the neuron level, this one coalition falls apart and a different mm -hmm. coalition is assembled. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really critical to think about these coalitions. Then we have to ask, how can we track them? How can we identify them in, in the brain? Can we do it in a living brain? And we're talking about neurons, large number of neurons, you know, maybe a coalition has a million neurons, maybe more, maybe less, but on that order of magnitude probably. And they only assemble for fraction of a second because I can quickly sh shift my consciousness. So for that brief time, I have to catch them in the act. And it's very difficult to do because brain imaging is very crude and that gets at all the activity over many seconds inside a very large part of the brain Why I really need to track it at the level of the individual neurons. But I think that's really the way we need to think about them. Um, the mind-body problem in terms of conscious mind on one hand and collision of neurons on the other hand. I think that's one of the key elements. Many people would say that that is indeed part of the picture, but there are many other things that we need to take into consideration. Some people, as you said, said there's activity in quantum physics and the collapse of the wave function or other kinds of things. Other people think that, that there's a, 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 the, the social involvement is exceedingly important, that you can't have consciousness without the social relationship uh, I mean, you can't even have it in principle. Yeah, so I think experimentally, so for example, social, let's talk about social. There's no question that if you deprive me, if I grew up, you know, if I never meet a, another living person, I will be severely disturbed individuals, no question about it. And there are, of course, unfortunate cases of orphanages where, where something similar to this happens, or Kaspar Hauser, other cases. However, I, I, we're talking about something, simple forms of consciousness, like seeing. I've yet to see any experimental evidence in animals that you can deprive, of course, or in people, that such an unfortunate individual wouldn't be able to consciously see or smell. And I, I doubt that. I doubt that, I doubt that, you, that social deprivation, horrible as it is, would really deprive that individual from the ability to consciously see or smell. I think those Simple forms of consciousness that are most of our lives is involved in these simple forms of consciousness pain, pleasure, seeing, smelling, hearing, remembering. Those things, I think, are inherent in our natures and they are much, they can be modulated by social and culture things, but they're really, they're so strong, they will express themselves no matter what, under almost any condition they'll express themselves. Let's go to the other end of the scale where some people, not too many, think that you must involve quantum mechanics levels of, of orders of magnitude very far below the level of the synapse in order to make sense out of consciousness. Okay, so two things. So one, there's no question that quantum mechanics is a fundamental theory that underlies all of physics, which of course underlies all of the brain. So there's no question about that. As well as the chair and the, and the ceiling and everything, everything. else. Everything. We need quantum mechanics for all of that. What these people mean is that they, they're looking for some microscopic quantum event like entanglement or superposition that that's key to consciousness. Well, I mean, it sure sounds neat, it's mysterious, there's 
you know, collapse of the wave function and Schrodinger's cat, and isn't that all mysterious, wonderful? But there's no evidence for it. So solving two mysteries with one idea. Exactly. That's, I mean, that's really the key idea. You have two mysteries and you try to solve them with one, but there's no evidence for that. Furthermore, the brain is by physical standards, by standards of quantum mechanics, are very hot. It's 300 degrees Kelvin, it's room temperature, it's an aqueous solution, and it's the worst possible uh, place to get any of these microscopic quantum effects. When people, when physicists measure them, they measure them in the lab, usually at, you know, a few degrees above absolute zero, right, at very, very cold temperature. Sure. And usually they involve high so, highly isolated, very simple systems. And the brain is anything but isolated. As I said, it's very hard. It's, it's coupled to its environment, so it would be the worst possible place to look for such, such uh, microscopic quantum effects. You can't rule them out, but of course, it's very difficult to rule out almost every, uh, anything, but there's just no evidence. For, so I think right now, unless there's more compelling evidence, at least I and most of my colleagues have decided not to look at that level.